Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. We're going to take a look at Luke chapter 16, a parable, at least most people think it's a parable, called the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. We'll talk about why some people don't think it's a parable in, in just a minute. There's a lot of themes that are woven into this story. You have the themes of poverty and riches. You have the themes of afterlife, whether a good or a bad afterlife. You have the image of resurrection, but you also have at the very end this focus upon heeding the law and the prophets, listening and believing to the word of God. So we'll touch upon each of those as we work our way through it. And as always, we're going to draw upon the Old Testament scriptures to illumine what's happening here in this story. We're also going to use some other Jewish literature, which is going to help us to kind of understand the, the, the mindset of first century Jews and to help us to perhaps better understand some of the, the imagery and themes that are woven into this, into this story. So Luke 16, 19 through 21 is where we are going to begin to get to know the two main characters in this story. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. So that verb in Greek for clothed implies an ongoing state. So maybe whose custom it was to be in purple and fine linen. In other words, this was, wasn't just kind of something he wore on occasion. This was his everyday kind of clothing. And he feasted sumptuously, which could be translated from the Greek as he, he celebrated or he rejoiced every day sumptuously, splendidly. So he was, he was living the high life. You get the picture. At his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. So is this a parable or not? There are some people who think that it is not, mainly because this is the only parable, if it is a parable, in which you have one of the main characters named, Lazarus here, of course. So some people will link this up to a certain individual that we will get to in just a minute. I'll explain a little bit more about why they think that is. For my money, I think that it probably is a parable, simply because it falls into the pattern of this context where Jesus has been telling several different parables, beginning already in Luke chapter 15 with the three lost parables. So, for instance, look at the introduction to two of the prior parables that Jesus tells and then compare it with how he introduces this story. So, if you go back to the middle of Luke chapter 15, this is the introduction to the parable of the prodigal son. And in Greek, it is anthropos tis aken dua huius, a man had two sons. So, in Greek, he just called a man, or a certain man, anthropostis. You go to Luke 16, 1, which is the parable of the unjust steward, and it's, it's introduced basically verbatim the same way that this, this part about the rich man of Lazarus is introduced. Anthropostis and plusios. There was a rich man. So you go down to verse 19, the very beginning of what we're looking at now, basically the same in Greek. Anthropos de tis and plusios. There was a rich man. So this, parable, this parallel in language and the context of all these parables leads me to believe that what we're looking at here is just one more story that Jesus tells, a parable. And certainly it's unique because you have a named figure in this parable, but why you have a named figure, I'll get to in just a minute. I think there was a reason that Jesus parted from his ordinary way of telling parables by giving one of the main characters a name. Now, you may have heard this story referred to as Lazarus and Dives. Uh, that is basically just a Latin word that means rich man or, or, or wealthy person. And over time, tradition kind of gave that name to the wealthy person. But I think it's significant that he's, he's not named. What Lazarus, the poor man, the one who's basically ignored and, and, and oppressed, who just leads this, this terrible life of misery and suffering, who seems to be overlooked even by God, he gets a name, whereas the rich man remains anonymous. He doesn't have a name. So the very fact that you have this man that seems to be anonymous in the eyes of the world and certainly in the eyes of the rich man, he is the one whom God looks upon with favor, who, whom God knows by name. And of course, we do as well. Now back to the rich man. We're told that he was clothed in purple and fine linen. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, purple itself, by the way, in Greek, it's porphyra. Purple is 
it's something connected with people that were either royalty or they were very rich because it was very hard to come by. So it was made from a secretion from a marine snail. And ancient peoples used this secretion from a snail, from a whole bunch of them, to make a dye that was kind of in the red or purple spectrum. Thousands of these snails were necessary for a single robe. So, of course, that means that if you had a purple garment, it was a mark of royalty or of great wealth. Now, in Israel's history, if you go back to the book of Exodus, some of the cloth used in the tabernacle and the vestments of the high priest had this purple in them. And if you read Proverbs 31, that's the famous chapter about the wise woman. She has clothing of fine linen and purple, indicative of her wealth. And then also, if you go to Mark 15, 17, we read about the Roman soldiers. Remember when they were mocking Jesus? Well, they clothed him in a porfura, a purple cloak or a purple robe, and they hailed him as king. So purple is associated with wealth and with royalty. Of course, it's what you would expect from this character that we are introduced to. What about fine linen. Well, this one is kind of interesting as well, too. So in Greek, that is busos. That's a loan word, by the way, from Hebrew. Boots is the, is the Hebrew word, and that comes into Greek as busos. Basically, what we're looking at here with the fine linen is expensive, fancy, silky underwear. <laughs> That's what he's clothed with. So this is an undergarment that he wears, and then he's got the purple robe that he wears over it. This was kind of a very expensive, very fancy, very silky undergarment. So underwear, basically. And now, we the purple we, we just said was also connected with the vestments of the high priest. But if you go back to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that Greek word busos is used repeatedly in the Septuagint, Septuagint to describe the fine linen used in the tabernacle and in the vestments of the high priest. This is why, because purple and fine linen, both these Greek words, are associated with the high priest. That is why some people think that actually Jesus is telling this story about Caiaphas, the high priest. There's a guy named Stephen Cox. He has popularized this interpretation of the story. And this is why, because Lazarus' name, because the purple and fine linen match the high priest, and because Caiaphas had these brothers or brothers-in-law that are also going to be part of the story about the rich man having the five brothers. Many people, some people anyway, identify the, the background of this story as Caiaphas and his richness, his wealth, the fact that he, he was living sumptuously, that he was clothed in purple and fine linen. Now, as I've already indicated, I think this is a parable, so I don't think the the intended referent here is Caiaphas, but I just want you to be aware of that when you're listening or listening to or reading about the parable from different different perspectives. So what let's talk more about Lazarus himself. So first of all, he's he's laid at the rich man's gate. So this would have been a, a kind of a grand entrance to his courtyard. And the fact that he was laid there, probably indicative of the fact that he had to be carried there by friends, that's where he was, that's where he was was placed. Now his name, Lazarus, is very significant, not only because this is the only parable where one of the main characters is named, but also because Lazarus is a shortened Greek form of the Hebrew name Eleazar. Now the reason that's important is because when you go back to the book of Genesis and you read about Abraham, the very Abraham that's going to show up in our, in our story, Abraham had a servant by the name of Eleazar. So once more, you're going to have in this story a Lazarus and Eleazar who is going to be beside Abraham. So that's one of the reasons that I think that we have the poor man named. It's because of this Old Testament connection between Abraham and his servant Eleazar, and now between Abraham and this Lazarus, this Eleazar, who is going to be in his bosom at his side. Well, what about him? We, we hear that he's covered with, covered with sores. There are some people who think that maybe this is an indication that he's a leper. I don't think so, because I don't think that he would be in the city limits begging at this gate if he was an actual leper. Probably just covered in, in scabs or ulcers, some sort of sores. He's desiring to eat what falls from the rich man's table. This is kind of like the, the woman saying to Jesus at one time that even the dog eat the crumbs that, mall, that fall from their master's table. This is an unfulfilled wish, however. There's no indication whatsoever that his desire was fulfilled. He wanted to, but we're not told that he, that he did. But he would have been happy 
to join the place of the dogs and eating the very crumbs that fell from the table of this, this rich man. And speaking of dogs, they came up and licked his sores. Now, I love dogs. I know that many of you love dogs. Dogs are a man's best friend, as we call them. But in the biblical narrative, dogs don't have a good reputation. Uh, most of the time, in fact, I don't think there are any exceptions here. Mo all the time <laughs> that dogs show up in the biblical narrative, it is in a negative sort of way. In fact, if you read the Old Testament story very often, dogs are associated with consuming corpses. So don't think that the dogs came along and were helping Lazarus. If, if, if this is consistent with the biblical narrative, they made it worse. In fact, some argue that the Greek construction introducing this is saying something like, what's even worse? The dogs came and licked his, licked his sores. So an overall pathetic image, a, a terrible image about a man who's suffering, who, who is ignored, who seems to be the lowest of the low. But he does have a name, and as we'll find out, in just a second, that name is known by God, and Lazarus is elevated from the very lowest position on earth in this life to the very highest position in the bosom of Abraham. So let's read that section and see what happens after these two gentlemen die. This is 22 through 26. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. That's what ESV has here. The Greek here is more literally his bosom, his breast, his chest. So right there beside, beside Abraham, in his bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us." So let's first of all talk about what the bosom of Abraham means. And by the way, if, uh, if you know this hymn, you'll recognize this language. So, uh, Lord, Thee I love with, with all my heart is a, is a beautiful, beautiful hymn. And the final stanza of that is, Lord, let at last thine angels come to Abram's bosom, bear me home, that I may die unfearing. And then it goes on, but to Abram's bosom, bear me home. It's this image of being carried to this place of paradise and, and blessedness. So where do we get the, the image about Abraham's bosom? Well, both from the Old Testament as well as from some contemporary Jewish literature, they both have this image of being with the father or fathers or Abraham. So if you go back to Genesis, this is just a couple of representative verses. You could look at a whole lot more, but Genesis 15, 15, God tells Abraham, you shall go to your fathers in peace. So it's this idea of when you die, you go to your fathers. In Genesis 47, Jacob is instructing his kids. He says, don't bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. So take him out of Egypt and bury him back in the land of promise. So the idea being, taken to the fathers after death is rooted in the Old Testament. But look at these other two texts, one called 4th Maccabees and then one called the Testament of Abraham. There's dispute about their dating, but a lot of scholars will position them within the first century AD. So 4th Maccabees 13 says, for if we so die, this is the martyrs, the, the potential martyrs talking, for if we so die, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will welcome us. And all the fathers will praise us. So the martyrs are saying, or the, the potential martyrs are saying, if we die, well, then Abraham and the other patriarchs will welcome us. Just same thing that, that happens here with Lazarus. And the Testament of Abraham. And this is God talking to the angels. It says, lead my friend Abraham into paradise, where the tabernacles of my righteous are, and the dwellings of my saints, Isaac and Jacob, in his bosom. That's that same Greek language about Lazarus being in the bosom of of Abraham. So the bosom of Abraham is likely just another way of talking about paradise, uh, the place of blessedness, heaven, the presence of Christ, whatever you want to call it. There's a dip, various ways that the scriptures talk about this place of rest 
in which we await the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. That's where Lazarus goes, bosom of Abraham. It's also a position of feasting when you're, when, you're, when you're right beside someone at a feast and you're reclining at the table as they did then, then you're in their, in their bosom. So Lazarus, as it were, he's got this, this closest high position beside the patriarch himself. What about the rich man? Well, he's in Hades. So what, what is Hades? What, what is that exactly in the, the biblical narrative and how is it used in other places as well? Well, in, in ancient Greek, Greek literature, this is from the Lexham Bible Dictionary, by the way. In ancient Greek literature, of course, Hades could refer to either that Greek god, the Greek god of the underworld, or to the underworld itself. Now, in the Old Testament, in the, in the, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, Hades was simply the, the, the translation of Sheol, which Sheol is just the general Hebrew word for the place people go after they die. So it's not a place for the righteous. It's not a place for the unrighteous. It's just a, the, the grave, we might say. Sheol is the place where people go, is, is the name of the place where people go when they die. So when the Old Testament was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, they translated Sheol as Hades. So it was kind of just a, a generic word. However, when it's used in the New Testament, it does sometimes take on a more specific meaning as the place, not just of death, but of punishment. So in this case, of course, it is the place of punishment because he's, of course, in agony in these flames. So it's not just a general word for the place of death, but it is that specific place of punishment for the rich man as well as for all those others who are part of the unrighteous. So the rich man, he sees Abraham and Lazarus. He sees them afar off. Now, what's going on here? How how can he see them? What kind of topography are we looking at here? Well, there's a couple of different couple of different options as to how we might take this. The first option is based upon an understanding that at this stage, everybody at this stage in kind of Jewish thought, everybody is still going to the the underworld, and that there are specific places in the underworld where the righteous await the final judgment, and the unrighteous await the final judgment. So, for instance, if you go to the book of Enoch, 1st Enoch, chapter 22. This is, this is written before the first century. And in Enoch 22, there are, we read about these four pits that are dug in this mountain. And three of these pits are for the unbelievers, for the unrighteous. That's where their souls are kept until judgment. But there's one that's for the righteous. And the one that's for the righteous, where they are awaiting the final judgment or awaiting the resurrection, it has water in it. So there are some who argue that what's going on here is this kind of afterlife topography is in the background where Abraham and Lazarus are in this one place where everything is great. They have water. They're just simply awaiting the the judgment, awaiting the resurrection. And then at a distance from them in another place is where the unrighteous are, of course, including the, the rich man. So that's one way that this has been explained. My own opinion is that option two just makes more sense. Option two is that the bosom of Abraham is just another name for heaven or for the presence of God. That's where Abraham is. That's where Lazarus is. That's where all of the believers, all of those made righteous in the Messiah have gone. So the bosom of Abraham, another name for paradise or heaven itself. And then Hades is another name for hell or the place of everlasting torment. And in this parable, they are able to see one another as it were, from a distance. But there's no way, there's no way that one can go to the other or the other can go to to the prior one. There's a fixed gap or chasm between between these two. So, of course, this fits with the parable. It has to fit with the parable because there's about to be communication back and forth between Abraham and, and the rich man. So what does this communication consist of? Well, first of all, notice that the rich man refers to him as Father Abraham. So this is obviously a Jew. This is someone who believes that by physical descent, he does call him Father Abraham, that he that he he deserves to be heard. He didn't think that he was going to end up in this place, of course, because he thinks that since Abraham is his father, then he should have been, as it were, guaranteed not to be in Hades, but in the bosom of Abraham. Wrong, of course. But that was his assumption. And notice the language that he uses. He says, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and then cool my tongue. 
So even in this place of punishment, he is, well, first of all, he knows who Lazarus is. So the guy that was at his gate, the one covered in sores, the one who would have eat, gladly eaten the, the stuff that the dogs would eat that fell from the table, the rich man knew who he was, knew him actually by name, and still ignored him. And now in the afterlife, when he's in torment, he wants Abraham basically to, to reduce Lazarus down to the, the place of a servant. So Abraham, tell Lazarus to be my servant. I'm in torment, so have him dip the tip of his finger in water and then come and cool, cool my tongue. Because, of course, he's in agony in these flames. It's a, it's a good indication of the fact that the afterlife does not change people. We, we sometimes get the idea that, you know, when, when, people, when people are in the place of punishment, that they're somehow going to wake up to the realization that they should have, they should have made better choices and they're, they're going to be filled full of regret and repentance, but there's really nothing that they could have can do about it at this point, that they're, they're, they're really better people, but it's too late is kind of the idea. There's no indication of that whatsoever. Uh, going to Hades or going to hell or going to a place of punishment, whatever you want to call it, is always a willful choice for those who go there. It's like C.S. Lewis said, hell's doors are locked from the inside. This is where they, this is where they actually chose to be. And the rich man is unchanged. He is in the afterlife, the exact same man that he was in life on earth. He still looks down. He's looking up, as it were, but he's still looking down on Lazarus and views him as someone that should be his servant, someone that's lower than, than he is. The language, by the way, of, uh, of the fire and, 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 and the thirst, it's very common. You have it in the last chapter of Isaiah. In fact, that's the way Isaiah ends, about talking about the fire that is in the place of punishment. You have this in multiple sources of extra-biblical Jewish literature as well, where fire is connected with the place of punishment. Of course, this appears in Revelation as well. And with fire, also thirst. Thirst being a metaphor for those who are cut off from God, who are in the place of, in the place of fire. And then finally, this chasm has been fixed because there is no going from one to the other. After, the, the judgment, after a person's death, the judgment has been rendered. And one is here or one is there, and there's no switching. There's no going back and forth between, between these two. So that is kind of the first dialogue that takes place between Lazarus and the rich man, but it's going to continue with one more dialogue between them. This is verses 27 through 31. Then he said, that is the rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them. The Greek there is dia marturomai, which could be also translated as bear witness or solemnly exhort. It's often used positively in the scriptures for bearing witness about the deeds of Christ. So he wants him to go and warn them, to bear witness to them, so that lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. By the way, the fact that he, he says, no, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent, is the, the rich man's way of actually admitting that his brothers aren't going to listen to Moses and the prophets. It's going to take something more for them. The word will not be sufficient for them. They need, they need this uh, visitor from the afterlife to come to them and preach to them. Otherwise, they're not going to pay any attention. They're not going to listen to Moses and the prophets. He knows this. He knows that his brothers are exactly the same way that he is, and that's why he wants Abraham to send Lazarus as a preacher to them. Picking up with the rest of the text, Abraham said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, just let that sink in for a moment in the broader biblical story of, of the Gospels, because what happened well, there was a guy, not this Lazarus, but another Lazarus, of course, the brother of Mary and Martha, who did die and whom Jesus did raise from the dead. And what happened after he was, after Lazarus came back from the dead? Well, if you read in John's gospel, what immediately transpired is that this news was reported to the adversaries of Jesus and they began to plot even more fervently how they might put Jesus to death. So, 
as vindication, as it were, of the truth of this parable, just read in John's gospel about the raising of Lazarus and what transpired afterward. Even though Jesus raised someone from the dead, even though Lazarus was there to to tell them what had happened, it actually had the opposite effect. Rather than believing, the adversary of Jesus hardened their hearts even more. Why? Because they would not listen to Moses and the prophets. They would not listen to the word of God. This for me is, is, a, is, is a powerful testimony to the fact that, that faith that is solely based on miracles has an extremely short shelf life. If, if faith is based entirely upon miracles, you don't have to know much of the Bible to realize that it's not going to last very long. Just read the Torah. Look at what happened to the Israelites. They saw what? They saw God rescue them out of Egypt. They saw the ten plagues. They saw the waters of the Red Sea part and the, the Egyptians killed. They saw the miracle of the manna. They saw the miracle of water from the rock. They saw the miracle of the quail. They saw miracle after miracle after miracle. And yet, what happened? Rebellion, murmuring, grumbling, disbelief, rebellion, punishment. So just because someone sees a miracle, even the miracle of someone coming back from the dead, is no guarantee that a person is going to believe. Instead, what is our faith founded upon? It's founded upon what God has said in his word which here in this parable is the law and the prophets, which is a kind of a, a, a shorthand for the Old Testament, for the scriptures. The law being the Torah, the five books of Moses, and the prophets being a catchphrase that described all the rest of the Old Testament writings. So if they won't listen to the scriptures, if they won't give heed to Moses and to the prophets, then nothing is going to work. Now, this, I think, when you get to the very end of the parable, is what the parable is mainly all about. Lazarus did not go to the bosom of Abraham because he was a poor man. He went to the bosom of Abraham because he believed Moses and the prophets. And keep in mind, too, this cannot be some kind of simplistic parable about, well, poor people go to heaven and rich people go to hell. Because who is rich in the Old Testament? Abraham is rich. Abraham is a rich man, extremely wealthy man in the Old Testament. And it is to him that Lazarus goes. And then he is ignored by this other rich man, the rich man at whose gate he was laid. So it's not a simple, simplistic story about the the poor going to heaven and and the, the rich going to hell. This is a story about heeding the word of God, listening to what God tells us, listening to his promises, clinging to those promises because they speak truth and life into us. The, Lazar- the, the rich man did not do that. He rejected it, and he, he knew that his brothers would as well. Lazarus believed it. He went to the bosom of Abraham because he clung by faith to those promises. And because of that, we see the great reversal that's a theme of all the Gospels, where the, the lowly are lifted up and the high are placed down, and, and, and the poor are filled with good things, and the, and, the, and the rich are sent hungry away. This is the reversal that takes place throughout the Gospels. It's exemplified now in this parable about Lazarus and the rich man. So if I were to kind of narrow it down to one main point of the parable, it would be this. God has spoken to us. He has told us of his love. He's told us of his mercy in the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given these promises. And when he gives these to us, and they work faith in our hearts, and we cling to them, then rich or poor, high or low, we will go to the bosom of Abraham. But it doesn't matter where a person is in life, if they're rich or poor, if they're high or if they're low, if they do not give heed to what God says, if they reject his promises, then their place will be the same place as the rich man. So let us give heed, let us hear, let us believe, let us cling to what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And When at last our day comes, then the angels will bear us to the bosom of Abraham as well. And let me close with that final stanza that I began quoting earlier. Lord, let at last thine angels come to Abram's bosom, bear me home, that I may die unfearing. And in its narrow chamber, keep my body safe in peaceful sleep until thy reappearing. And then from death, awaken me that these mine eyes with joy may see, O Son of God, thy glorious face, my Savior and my fount of grace. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, my prayer attend, and I will praise thee without end. Amen. Thanks for watching.
We'll see you next week.